All right. Uh, so uh, I want to, first of all, re reiterate that uh, pl please interrupt me frequently, uh, I mean, if needed, um, because uh, I don't always know when I'm skipping something that's, that's not obvious or saying things that are too obvious. Um, for example, uh, this here is a brain. Um, some of you may recognize this as, uh, as the, the brain of uh, Paul Broca's patient, um, uh, from, from, from whom uh, we, we get Broca's aphasia and Broca's area and so on and so forth. And uh, you can see that Broca's area, by definition, is missing in this brain or is severely damaged. Um, I just wanted to put this up as a sort of, sort of uh, um, anchor for, for what we're going to be talking about, which is trying to understand um, the relationship between this and what that patient actually was able to do. And how that maps onto other patients. So this is the big picture for these four sessions. This is the plan. Again, um, please let us know what your preferences are because we can, we can change anything. Um, so today I'm going to give a sort of overview. This is more a conceptual overview of what VLSM is, how we go about it. I'm going to try to do my best to uh, to make it as as uh, um, to make it as demystified as possible because I, I think uh, uh, it's it's actually conceptually and even in, in a lot of the details very simple, um, and uh, it's not always obvious that it's so simple from the way it's reported. Um, the remaining sessions are going to cover things like drawing lesions, uh, how to handle registration of brains, and the uh, final session is going to co cover uh, hands-on um, with uh, some of the steps of, in carrying out the analysis. Um, and I also want to mention that I think a lot of this, I, I think it really is an important part of this, uh, this uh, series to, to sort of um, demystify this procedure. And I think even for those of you who don't actually expect to sit down and need to carry, this, carry these analyses out, I think that session four, and, and as well as sessions two and three, um, even though there's a lot of hands-on content to them, they, they will be very valuable in, uh, in making it clear just how simple uh, all, this, all this really is. Um, in much the same way that, that you know, anything is, is, is simple once you, once you get past the sort of um, uh, magical aspect that's reported in articles. So. Today uh, will be less hands-on hands -on stuff, less about how to do, go about things, and more about background. So the, the general way I like to situate, situate VLSM is uh, in the context of, uh, of the general enterprise of mapping brain, brain behavior relationships in humans. Um, uh, the humans part is, uh, is important because uh, there are extra options available if you're going to um, look at other animals. Um, so the lesion method, which is what, what VLSM amounts to, is, uh, is really, uh, in some form, the oldest useful method, um, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, dating at least to Broca, but cer certainly really before, before that. Um, and aside from improvements in, in uh, technology for imaging, uh, um, most notably for, for, for us these days, uh, the advent of MRI over the past 40 years, um, the, the advances in lesion behavior mapping um, have been pretty incremental for the past 150 years. There have been a few, uh, few nice, nice steps forward, but um, on the whole, I would say we're not doing anything that's really that dramatically different in enterprise than, than what uh, um, Paul Broca would have done if, if he'd had a group of 10 or 15 patients. Um, much more popular these days is, is, is functional imaging. Um, fMRI came, came, came around, came about in, in the early 90s. Um, it got really popular around 1995, I, I would say. And uh, of course, there are lots of other functional imaging modalities. But uh, if you go to cognitive neuroscience meetings or other other meetings has to do with, having to do with neuroscience or neuropsychology, uh, there's lots of fMRI talk. Um, and it's an area of tremendously active development in uh, in experimental design, in acquisition, uh, in analysis, and uh, lately even even in terms of uh, real world applications. Um, I don't know how good an idea that is, but it's, it's certainly popular. Uh, And uh, the last thing on the slide is, is uh, TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, there, there, there are also newer techniques that are similar. But um, in general, the idea behind this technique is, is to, to have a, a truly experimental, um, yet IRB-friendly uh, method for inducing temporary lesions, so to speak. Um, so it's, it's somewhat more invasive than, than MRI, in, in a sense. Um, but uh, it, it addresses some of the frustrations of people who tried to use these other methods. And, uh, it's sort of obvious when you when you consider that that the lesion method is is inherently non-experimental. We're not going out and administering lesions to randomly selected patients. Mm -hmm. um, could you say what the TMS stands for again? Oh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So basically, you just put a big coil on somebody's head and uh, and uh, um, uh, electrically uh, interfere with uh, what's going on in the underlying cortex. Um, so it's a pretty cool technique. I mean, there have been uh, techniques for for um, fiddle, you know for messing messing with people's brains before. I guess there were cooling techniques that were 
briefly used, but um, TMS is, 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 is basically the only experimental option in humans, I think. It's the only one that's wildly popular. So the question is, and this, this was, was raised explicitly in the title of an article by uh, uh, Rorden and Karnath in 2004, is, uh, is, is the lesion method still useful or is it a relic from a past era in, in the fMRI age? Um, and you could make the, you could make, make the case uh, um, for it being a relic. Uh, fMRI is certainly more fun. That doesn't really, that's not really a huge, com hugely compelling argument. Um, uh, easy is a compelling argument because easy um, at some level uh, equates to, to dollars. Um, it's attractive to people for some reason, and, and for, for, uh, for, I guess, fun, attractive, and popular are really always saying the same thing, which is that people enjoy it. Um, lesion analysis, by, by, in the same way, is uh, somewhat prob problematic. Uh, many people don't have access to patients. There are also people who don't have access to MRI scanners, but um, on the whole, there seem to be many more people who can do uh, fMRI than who can do um, lesion behavior mapping. It's very difficult. Even if you're even if you're at a place like I'm I'm, I'm at Penn, uh, we have a we have a program to uh, to recruit patients, and uh, the patients come in slowly. Um, patients are, are not only hard to f hard to find depending on how um, how strict your inclusion criteria are, um, they also perform in a way that's highly variable, which increases the size of the needed uh, needed groups, and uh, they're uh, just by the nature of the injuries that that land them in lesion studies, they they tend to be an aging population, which uh, makes it difficult to um, to disentangle uh, issues related specifically to aging and those related specifically to the injuries. Um, and of course, the other ma another major problem with with lesion analysis is that lesions are distributed non-randomly. Strokes don't just randomly happen in a certain part of the brain, but they they happen um, where uh, where major blood vessels are, um, where those where those blood vessels tend to get choked off. So, uh, all of these make lesion analysis a little bit less practical in enterprise than, than, than we would like. Whereas with fMRI, it's very easy to, uh, to go out and recruit 30 healthy undergraduates who are, for all practical purposes, identical, um, and uh, run them in the fMRI scanner over the course of uh, a few weeks, or if the scanner's backed up, it'll take a month or so. Um, maybe a little longer. Uh, so just in terms of, in terms of practicality, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, there, there's a certain asymmetry. and. Um, uh, Leslie Fellows and, and a few of her fellow uh, then postdocs at, at Penn did a, did a, uh, a literature review and uh, um, discovered that, in fact, not only do uh, is fMRI dominating the literature, but fMRI people tend to cite fMRI articles disproportionately, um, whereas people who do lesion behavior mapping will cite whatever is relevant. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a little unfair. Um, <laughs> so it's... Uh, I, I often find it helpful to compare VLSM to fMRI because fMRI is, for many people, m uh, more familiar. If it's not more familiar to you, then this may not be that uh, compelling. But um, it, it is a real question, which is why not just do fMRI? fMRI seems to give us a way to sort of look inside the box and see what's going on while cognition is happening. Um, so the one reason I think that's uh, cited the most, um, most often is that VLSM, or any kind of lesion behavior mapping, addresses the issue of necessity in the sense that uh, when, a, when, a, when a function disappears after that brain region is lesioned, um, you, you, can, you can draw a stronger, not exactly ironclad, but a stronger inference um, to the effect that, that that area is necessary for that function, um, especially if it, if it tends to be a consistent relationship across a large group of patients. Um, TMS would be an even more uh, compelling way to do that because you can experimentally, um, and within subjects, uh, <coughs> remove and restore that, that region in principle. Uh, whereas fMRI really only addresses involvement, you can you can certainly have uh, have an area in the brain that lights up during an fMRI study that uh, is is in every way uh, epiphenomenal to the to the cognitive function of interest. Um, seems to light up when it's going on, but isn't really that important for it. Um, and it's easy to see this see this kind of thing in uh, in the case of kind of well in in sort of simple cases. You can imagine a way to design design your way around them. But I always think of uh, of uh, somebody in the scanner trying to make a difficult decision. And some of your trials are more difficult than others. And uh, you can imagine that um, as they're getting ready to make a finger press response, they'll lift their finger up and go, mm, sort of mentally roll their eyes back in their head, think for a second, say, aha, and then, and then hit the button. And you can imagine all sorts of, thing, all sorts of things in your brain might, might be going on while you're holding that finger in the ready position that have, just have to do with, with, with waiting to make a response. So that's a, that's a little bit, uh, you know, that's a sort of general problem having to do with response time confounds and fMRI. But um, in, 
more generally, you, you can't be certain that anything you see in an fMRI study is, uh, is causally related to the behavior of interest. Um, it's, it's in, in that sense, a, a really correlational technique. Um, the other thing that's, that, that I think is, is particularly difficult about uh, understanding fMRI that, that's less of a problem for, for VLSM is that, um, well, it is a different problem for VLSM, is that regions critical for tests may be difficult to identify with fMRI contrasts. Um, for reasons that are specific to fMRI. Um, for example, uh, the, the hippocampus is a pretty good example. A lot of people think it has something to do with memory encoding, and there's lots of good evidence for, uh, for that. But it's very hard to turn off memory encoding, and it's, it's been historically difficult to uh, light up the hippocampus in an MRI scanner for actually two reasons. One is because it's, an area of the, it's in an area of the brain that's hard to image well. Um, but the other reason is that it performs a function, we think, um, that uh, it's hard to turn off, um, an fMRI sort of runs on, on contrast, on being able to contrast, you know, an area where it's, when it's working, when it's not working. So it's been a little tricky to, to, to elicit the fMRI. I may be dating myself a little bit because I, I think people have, have gotten better at it uh, in the past few years. But um, it's not always obvious how to, um, how to get, how to isolate the cognitive function you're looking for in, in an fMRI in a way that's going to uh, really turn it off in the brain, um, or at least dif differentiate it in the brain. There's some other practical differences between, uh, between um, VLSM and fMRI. Um, I, I already mentioned something to do with, with just generally with practicality of, of finding patients. There's also the direction of causality, and this is kind of a trivial difference, but it makes, it makes a very practical difference when you're carrying out the analyses, and that's that in fMRI, conceptually, the task you're doing, the task, the, the task you've been instructed to perform, causes your brain to go in, into a certain state. And we know this because we give subjects instructions that, that, that cause the brain to go in that state. We don't, we don't stimulate their brain and see what, see what tasks they start doing. Um, so in, in that sense, the image is, a, is the big dependent variable that we're using when, we, when we're trying to model the data. Um, in VLSM, it's, it's the other way around. The, VL, the, the image tells us where, where, the, where the lesion is. So the, the dependent variable is performance. Um, in some ways, it's a much more, um, more comfortable model for, for psychologists. Um, so as a practical matter, it means that the software has to be basically turned upside down in order, in order to carry out a lot of the analyses. Um, and the final thing that I want to mention by comparison is for those of you who are familiar with fMRI analysis, um, in fMRI, one of the big problems is that the images are autocorrelated. So um, the, the, you, 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 carry, you collect a whole new brain image every three seconds or so. And uh, the first image is, uh, is not completely independent of, of the second image. They're, 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 um, the blood flow is, is slow to change. Um, in, uh, in lesion analysis, but, uh, oh, and so and then what happens in fMRI is you, you take, taking, in, taking account of that autocorrelation, you construct a map of that subject's behavior, and often you bring it to a second tier analysis where you're combining um, information about subjects. So you, you have a summary of each subject, and that's what you perform your group analysis on. Um, in lesion analysis, you only have one, typically, volume per subject. You have a map of where their lesion is. So there's no autocorrelation problem, and it's, it's very much like a second-tier analysis in fMRI, for anybody who's familiar with how that works. So these are some sort of questions I thought of in terms of what would a lesion behavior correlation mean. Um, maybe this, this slide should have been a little later, but um, there, are, there are lots of issues in terms of how to, how to interpret correlations, even, even if you, you know, you're lucky enough to find something reliable. Um, Correlations between uh, between the location or severity of damage and um, behavior. These are these are three that I that I thought are pretty common concerns. Um, one is the most obvious one, which is that the damage region normally performs the impaired function. For example, if uh, if patients with damage to the anterior temporal pole often have have trouble, um, you know, singing, um, maybe the anterior temporal pole is your singing lobe, and, and that's what it does. The most sensible description of, of its function would be singing. Maybe I should have picked a more realistic example. Um, the other possibility is that the damaged region interacts with other regions um, in subserving the, subserving the impaired function, or in, in, in perhaps it's not even really specifically related to the in, impaired function, but it, uh, it contributes information that's helpful for the regions that do perform that function. So maybe singing goes, really goes on somewhere else in the brain, but it requires some kind of input that, that the anterior temporal lobe provides. 